Shares for beginners. The world of stockbroking and equities is full of sharks. You've got brokers that are getting paid to promote stocks and they're getting fees for doing so. Probably they don't own any of the stocks themselves. So you've got to understand that everyone in this industry, with respect to the industry as much as I can, are out there to look after themselves. So people will sell you what they need to sell you to get you into something. It's that used car salesman that needs to make rent by selling a car. He's going to tell you whatever he can to get that car sold and doesn't really care what happens after that. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. How do you manage nearly a billion dollars, that's a billion with a B, dollars worth of funds before you're 30 years old with a team all under the age of 40 from the New South Wales Central Coast? It's not exactly Wall Street. To explain all this, I'm joined by Mitchell Atkins. G'day, Mitchell. G'day. Mitchell Atkins is the founder and managing director of Magnolia Capital, which is a boutique funds management and advisory group with nearly $1 billion in funds under advice, operating across Australia, Hong Kong and Singapore. Its Australian microcap fund was the top performer in its category in 2021, returning over 70%, and its large cap fund also returned over 80%. So Mitchell, let's um, just get started by talking about uh, life before Magnolia. Yeah, no problem. So my life and my career started out a little bit different to your typical investment banker, equity research analyst. I, obviously from a very small, not too small, but a surfy community, um, going through the HSC, I honestly had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was talking to the career advisor. I didn't really want to pay for uni. So he said, why don't you get into an accounting and have a look at cadetship? So not knowing really anything about it, jumped on, applied for some jobs in the big city. So I was successful enough to get a nice interview, headed down on the on the train in an oversized suit with a bright orange backpack and um, had a chat. So I was lucky enough to get a cadetship where I worked full time and studied part time. So I did two to three uni subjects per semester. In accounting? In accounting and tax accounting on the minimum wage. So about a year into that, the manager at the firm left to go to BDO, another big accounting firm. So they offered me a few thousand dollars more. And when you're on the, I guess, the poverty line as a cadet, you take what you can. So I left and joined BDO in the advisory and restructuring division. And then from there, I went on to Deloitte and did a small stint overseas and then jumped out like most career hungry guys, jumped into private equity investment banking, chasing the the extra dollars in the prestige, realized you're working a billion hours and not making that much money when you put it down to things. So I um, stepped out and decided to start Magnolia. Just before we go on to the, the beginnings of Magnolia, I've talked to a few people and when they've come from an accounting background, it's actually a fantastic grounding in terms of reading a company and reading its balance sheets and knowing exactly what's going on with an accountant's eye. Is that um, how it works for you? Yeah, definitely. So having that restructuring turnaround background is you're looking at everything and dealing with companies that have always gone bad and you're figuring out why they went bad and and how the directors did something to hide something or maybe use a bit more razzle than they should have. So our fundamental approach is looking at what's the core asset? What do they actually have and how much of this, especially in the microcap space, is hyped or um, non-tangible? Yeah, because that's a hard thing to ascertain, isn't it? And, and when you say what's something that they have, are you talking about something on the balance sheet or something on the revenue side of things? So um, a combination of both. So having good assets, so it's not an overvalued idea, which we see a lot in, for example, tech companies, that you're paying a lot of money um, or adding a lot of valuation to these big future earnings and when they're really underlyingly not that best company, they're burning a lot of cash. So we will look for a company that if it all went under, how much per share are we going to get back as shareholders? It's interesting that you've worked in private equity as well, because I don't think a lot of people actually understand the size of the private equity universe and how big it is compared to the listed universe. And there's completely different rules, aren't there, for companies operating in those spaces? Yeah, definitely. So the private equity world, you're not as regulated as the the listed investment world. You don't have the ASX. You traditionally only have a handful of investors that are in the fund that owns the company. So they're a step back where in a listed environment, you own shares directly into in the underlying business. And th- I guess that was my real awakening to the world. Like I left school thinking $50,000, $100,000 was a lot of money. And you move into private equity and everyone's talking in billions. They're doing a billion dollar purchase of a business and they're paying all cash. So it was, it was a re- really amazing how big the private equity world is, as you said, and how undervalued it is. 
Mm. And um, I think it's interesting, just recently, for example, wasn't it Sydney Airport that went private? And part of the reason is because of the more hands-off regulation environment. Yeah, um, combination of that. And you spend a lot a lot of money a year. It costs a few million dollars to be listed. And it comes back to the notion of why does a company actually list? If it's such a good company, like why do they need to raise money? Why do they need to go on the ASX heavily scrutiny to burn more capital? So that's another, I guess, a tip is to understand the evolution of the company. And listing sometimes can be a bad thing from an investor's perspective to cash founders out. The more transparency does help listed companies raise more capital and go for their growth phase. Um, but at the same time, it gives people the cash out, gives the seed investors an exit. And you just need to make sure that the management, for example, are hanging around and the business is going to get into the future. Okay, so you're basically, uh, you know, on your big bucks of fifty to a hundred thousand a year. Yeah. <laughs> what was that next step into starting Magnolia Capital? Pretty much that. So through my, I guess, the whole career, I made a lot of good relationships, and then we started Magnolia. It was actually named after my street. So um, everyone asks that question: Where does Magnolia come from? And everyone thinks we spent massive amount of money branding and researching yeah yeah <laughs> focus grouping it yeah, exactly i just simply just walked outside after some frustration couldn't find any names and, and that's how magnolia came so yeah so we built some good relationships we um, got a handful of smaller investors early on and they're still investors to this day and from there the business has been really built around them and uh, just talk to us a little bit about that journey yeah so magnolia we really started doing um, lending. So we were one of the first or the early adapters into the non-bank lending space. Kept it very, very simple, good assets, first mortgages, yeah, very short-term deals. And then it, it, it's slowly evolved from there. We did one deal and then before we know it, we're doing 100 deals a month. So how many people are in your team and um, what are the relative ages of the group? So uh, there's about 40 all up. It does fluctuate around the different business units. Everyone's younger in age, but we don't like to look at age. We're not ageist at all. Um, it comes down to your experience and how hard you want to work. Yes, the demographic is younger. But that being said, we have older people around the business, like some of our investors or advisors, and then we sur- surround ourselves with good service providers. Probably 50% of the team, we've crossed paths in some way, shape or form. So we've either worked together, we've been on the other side of transactions together, and it's become more like a family and a great group of mates. What do you think the mindset is like now? I mean, it actually sounds like um, it's more of a surfer community type of community that you've got rather than your know, traditional funds management business. Yeah, I'd like to say it's, it's a bunch of high-performing individuals with their own skill set. When it all comes together, it's amazing. And we challenge, we ask why we're not afraid to voice our opinions to get where we need to go. So we're, we're the kind of guys, if we don't know, we'll put our hand up and ask. So who are your clients? So we've got four ultra high net worth investors that have been there since day one. So Australian-based um, individuals. And then we have around 100 to 200 individuals around that that are wholesale clients. So net assets of $2.5 million, and they meet that wholesale requirement under the Corps Act. We like to work with the larger silent investors, given that the business side are very small. We don't have the the bandwidth and the, and the capabilities to have 2,000 investors. So we've got smaller, closer investors that we have very good relationships with. So this is very different to the kind of funds we often cover on this uh, on this podcast and ETFs and so forth. So you're actually laser-like targeting a certain client base. Correct, yep. Really targeting the ultra high networks where a lot of people and other fund managers target the retail to get the spread of investors and mitigate that risk. And also they're less fee conscious in a way where our business is we're heavily invested with our investors so we're very performance driven and we have thicker chunks of capital rather than yeah running a, a team of distributions because we're we know at the end of the day our business is performance based if we don't perform an investor is going to get up and leave if we're not providing the best service they will leave and they're smart guys and girls they'll invest with other providers so we're always so motivated to be the best that we can so you have institutional investors as well, don't you? Um, yep. So I'll try out with family offices as well and institutions on the smaller end of town. Yeah. What is an institutional investor? You come across it when you start talking about the markets and that, um, you know, sometimes there's big movements happening on the markets and they say it's the instos. Yeah. What's your view? What's your explanation of 
where this is. So to keep it simple, it's the bigger funds that run money on behalf of a lot of investors. So I think of it as a super fund, for example, and especially in the micro cap and the smaller end of town, institutions, they're very highly regarded because once an institution invests, and we need to be careful about the definition of when an institution invests, it shows that the company is credible because everyone puts this emphasis on the, the big guys coming in, the company is great, it's going to progress. So they essentially piggyback on the back of the smarter people, the Wall Street stereotypical guys. But that can also work the other way as well because um, there's a lot of weight of capital that they'll put into a smaller company and if they suddenly think, well, you know, we shouldn't be here, taking that money out can really affect the share price significantly, can't it? Exactly. And it's a little bit of a tangent, but what people need to be careful of is that there's smart money and there's cheap money and then there's the hype money. So Sheep money, did you say? Sheep money. So it's the, the Twitter guys, the followers, the pumpers, the hype, and it can change a market dramatically. We're big supporters of um, maintaining orderly markets and and not promoting stocks because, yeah, you'll see an IPO, a company will list on the stock exchange, it'll have a, some advisors there to create amazing hype and then it starts to trend on the social medias. They all sell out, the company share price tanks and then the poor retail investors lose out. So on that institutional point, it's very important to understand when an institutional investor actually invests and making sure that it's not simply a custodian arrangement. And what I mean by custodian is everyday investors set up a Comsec account and their shares sit on a HIN, which is a unique identifier, and they can hold multiple shares. Once you get to a certain size like us, we sit our shares with a custodian, for example, Citibank. So if you go substantial in a market cap or any other company, Citibank is the holder and they have to lodge a substantial shareholder notice. So what people tend to get a little bit confused about is they think Citibank or Barclays is buying that company when in fact they're not where the person, the beneficiary behind Barclays. So I know there's a lot of comments around that um, and it's very easy for people to get confused. So that's um, when you're looking at the substantial shareholders report in a company that um, you're not actually seeing the reality there often. Correct. Yeah, Citibank is holding it, but they are holding it on behalf of myself, for example. So I still make the decision. They've done no due diligence. They're simply a custodian. Yeah. How can ordinary investors sort of pull that apart to see where the actual holdings come from? Or is there a way? You really need to find the research reports and keep it in perspective. So institutions are billion-dollar enterprises and corporations. So you've got to ask, especially in the microcaps and the small space, is why would they be investing? If they are, they'll have analysts covering it. So you can look through, do some Googling, jump onto the bigger guys, your vanguards, et cetera, where you can see all their holdings. And it's a great way to understand what they're buying and selling because they're very transparent. So answer your question, it is a little bit harder for everyday guys to figure it out, but at the same time, just keep that in perspective. As, as a rule of thumb, unless it's a bigger end of town called a billion-dollar market cap, they're not going to have an expensive analyst reporting on it. Mm. So tell us about the micro cap space. What's your definition of it? So per our fund guidelines, it means any company that has a market cap of under $500 million. Okay. And uh, how many companies would be in that universe? There's over a thousand, but call it 250 to 300 decent ones um, that you want to look at. And then you can bring that list down to 80 to 100 very easily. So what's your funnel look like to bring it down to that 80 or so out of the thousand? Based on my earlier comments, so look for good fundamental businesses with great management teams. We like to get our hands dirty. We're happy to and add skills our skill set to underlying businesses if we can. So understanding the cash burn if there's one, so making sure that they're fully capitalised because some companies undercapitalise and then some companies overcapitalise. So it's making sure that we understand that, understand where they are in the evolution of their life cycle. Are they the growth phase, the extreme growth phase, are they pretty much at peak? And then from there we invest, we monitor the company and then we work with the management to exit our position when we need to. So when you say you get your hands dirty, are you actually contributing operationally to these companies or advising in any way? Um, yeah, so we have monthly calls with the companies that we're hands on. And I like to say to the guys, call us for anything you need, whether it be a drill rig or you want an introduction. And if we can find two similar companies that we can see that work well together, we introduce a team and, and see how they go. So anyone can add money. It's really adding that value add. 
that really makes us different. Can you give us an example of this process in action? Yeah, so I've spoken about this before, so it's public information. Um, Marley Spoon, ready to make meals company, it rocketed. It got close to a billion dollar market cap. I think it did almost get there. Um, recently came back under, the market cap's about 120 mil now, so very, very heavily discounted. We're quite big holders in that company. So we've been in frequent correspondence with the, the management team and really helping them to understand the difference between the, the overseas markets, like the European and the US market, compared to the Australian market. And what do I mean by that is the US markets are very revenue focused, grow at all costs, don't worry about the cash burn. If you say you know, hit 10% growth, you hit 10% growth. Where the Australian market is, if you say you're going to grow, that's fantastic, but we're very cash burn focused. So the growth can be outweighed very, very quickly by your cash burn and being able to sell that story. So we spent some time helping them with that message. And then separately to that, in addition, sorry, um, we've introduced them to other companies, um, which I can't disclose, but have synergistic businesses to work with each other. So we've provided, I guess, a general advice on the market plus introduction to other companies to help them increase their revenue. And of course, this is no recommendation to buy any uh, stocks mentioned. But uh, that's interesting. So Australian investors are cash burn shy. Is that the case? Yeah, they like to have a clear path, which is more aligned to our way of investing, where the US is, you can have tech companies trading at ridiculous multiples. So how many companies have you got in each fund? And I guess we're talking about the micro cap now and the large cap fund. How many companies would you have in each fund at any one time and how actively managed are they? So about 30 to 40, and in the large cap, it's spread across a couple of different instruments. Yeah, so 30 to 40, we're very active, call it 60-40 split. So 40% of the funds actively traded and 60% is held. And a typical investment might be we like XYZ as an underlying long-term company. So we'll cornerstone a bit of the portfolio with that, and then we'll play the volatility or trade the volatility. And what I mean by that is the share price goes up, We'll sell some, then we'll buy back on the low and really trade the fundamentals. But at the end of the day, we understand that we like the company. It's a great company long term. So if we miss the trade or we buy it too expensively, for example, um, we're comfortable long term. And with the larger cap end, how does the funnel and how does the selection process differ to the micro cap space? Yeah, so it's very, very different. Micro cap, we're only looking at Australian based companies under 500 mil. Large cap, we've essentially got a mandate to invest really in anything we want to at any point in time. So at the moment, it's very short. So we're negative on a lot of economies and countries and companies. And we're very long on commodities directly, for example, gold. And by what I mean, like we own gold and we think it's going to go up in price, same as oil, for example. So it's more different types of securities rather than buying a share in a company. A lot of the time you hear that story that um, most fund managers underperform the market in the long term. How difficult is it to, you know, keep all the balls in the air and um, to put on a good show? Yeah, look, it is difficult to outperform the market, but that's what we're getting paid to do. You've got to be careful to a lot of funds are set up to, to pay investment managers management fees and create a cushy lifestyle for them. Where we're different is our management fees just covers costs. And we're heavily invested in the funds. So we're motivated to make money and outperform the market. Otherwise, we're not getting paid. So it's hard to outperform the market, but at the same time, we're very incentivized to do so. So we will work long days. We'll do whatever we can to get there. So this investment process then that you undergo, I mean, you've got 70% of funds under management from your own balance sheet and you're obviously, this sharpens your investing process. And so is this a little bit different to how the big end of town operates and some of the bigger managed funds, which are just bucketed into people's superannuation accounts? Yeah. So it's a little bit different. Like, So what it costs for us to run our business is a lot lower than the, the bigger end of town. Our positions are a lot smaller given how much capital we have. We have a drop in the ocean compared to what they have. So by us participating in the smaller end of town is we can buy positions, we can hustle harder where their balance sheet, their, their minimum investment might be $50 million, where we're investing in companies with market caps under $50 million. So it's hard to compare because they're a massive engine room. We're a smaller end of town and we're happier to, I guess, hustle 
for the good opportunities and work harder because we don't have to answer to big shareholders like they do and deploy large amounts of funds to make the capital they need to make to outperform. So we're very nimble, I guess, is the easiest way to explain it. Mm. I just want to go back to, you know, when you were, I know you're still young, but going back to when you were younger and um, you didn't do a finance degree. So you've learned everything on the job. Yeah, a lot. I'll be the first to say my uni marks weren't fantastic. A lot of what I learned is by working hard. So I was always been the, the hardest worker at the big four. So I was looking at a big four and then doing three uni subjects a semester, sleeping three to four hours a night. Like I was running myself to the ground because I knew I had to work harder than everybody else because everybody else came from a different path that I came from. They went to good schools. They got good degrees. They got good marks. And it was easier for them to come in where I had to do it the harder way. And like I went from a very small tax accounting firm to BDO, I think it was top five accounting practice, purely because I worked hard for someone that recognised that when they left. And then that's how I went to Deloitte as well. So that mindset of working hard, learning as much as you can from like the real skills in life, and it's the same as investing. We start very small, been doing it for a very long time now relative to how, how long we've been around. And we've learned the hard way. I've had bad investments there's been nights where you've got taken big positions, you think it's a great company, and then all of a sudden the share price is going down. So it's that, that real-life skill set and learnings that have shaped where we are today. It's a great story to hear. You're just basically hungrier than most. Hungrier, yeah. And now we're getting to that stage where like, we had no systems when we first started. And we tested – when I say first started, so we tested – we created a portfolio. We ran it with our own capital. A few years later, then we go out to market and raise the capital. So we like to make sure that everything's – going great so we've gone from yeah running a few million dollars to 50 plus in you know fund very small fund then the systems then everything's coming and the infrastructure is coming behind that so it's making us achieve better results because we're not paying extremely high brokerage um, we've got access to more deals so we're generating that that alpha yeah i gotta say I, I came to this interview with a completely different mindset about the kind of person you were because I, I figured you're so young and you're managing all these funds you know you must have just come from a privileged background and uh, worked in the family company and then just um, had a couple of other family companies that you can draw on. But um, it's completely different to that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It came from zero. Wow, that's great. So you've obviously got a lot of experience now. What advice would you give any young investors approaching the markets for the first time? Yeah, so really understand companies that you understand yourself. So it's that mindset. If you can't explain it in 30 seconds to somebody, don't do it. It's like the cryptocurrencies, I don't understand it. I don't pretend that I do, so I stay away from it. But ask me about a gold mine, I can chew you off all day if you really wanted. So first, stick to something you like. Practice, like get a share trading account, get a paper account, start to learn. When you're ready, throw a small amount of money in and something that you can afford to lose. And don't run it like a sports bet account. Run it like you're running a business. It's not gambling. It's making educated decisions based on what you like about a company and you believe it's got a future. And then before you go into a, a trade or buy something, set your boundaries. So if it gets to X price, I am going to sell. So as soon as you buy it, set the sell. Leave it open for and good till cancelled. And if it gets here, it gets here. Don't move it because greed will always kick in, especially early on. And realise that majority of share investing, especially in the smaller end of town, a lot of it's mental. So... What I mean by that is the company is great, but Jim down the road has just woken up and they need to buy a new house, so he needs to sell his holding. So he goes on and sells his holding and decreases the share price because there's no liquidity in the market. There's no buyers there to, to buy what he wants to sell at the right price. So it decreases. So it's not a perfect market. So be prepared for big swings, but make sure you understand how that company trades. So what I mean by that is how much gets traded per day? Is it a busy trading day? Is it a low trading day? And that way, when the share price moves, go, okay, it moved up today because a lot of people bought, which is a good sign, or it moved down today because only X amount, 10% of the normal trades got done. So it's it's really having that understanding of how the company operates and the shareholder base behind it. And then be prepared to lose. Like If you nail 50% of your trades or more, you're going to make money. Less than that, you're not. And no one's perfect. So set your amount, stick to it, 
and then make sure you're having fun at the same time. And having fun at the same time. <laughs> That's good advice, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah, you've got to have fun. Yeah, are you having fun? Yeah, I have fun. I love seeing companies go well. Like we've had a good run with a fair few companies. You get up, you have fun. Even on the smaller trades, like it's good. <laughs> Even if it's a few thousand dollar trade for us, like it's very small. But you nail it. You get up in the morning, you're happy. So that's what gets me out of bed. You referred a little while ago to some of your mistakes. Any mistakes you can share with us? It's more around just like buying into companies that you think are going to be better than what they are. And the world of stockbroking and equities is full of sharks. You've got brokers that are getting paid to promote stocks and they're getting fees for doing so. Probably they don't own any of the stocks themselves. So you've got to understand that everyone in this industry, with respect to the industry as much as I can, are out there to look after themselves. So people will sell you what they need to sell you to get you into something. It's that used car salesman that needs to make rent by selling a car. He's going to tell you whatever he can to get that car sold and doesn't really care what happens after that. So the biggest mistakes, I guess, I came into this too trusting and not understanding, I guess, everyone's motivations in a transaction. So, yeah, early on we made a few bad deals based on, I guess, companies reporting or presenting to be what they should have been. But when you pulled back um, the covers, it wasn't kosher. Yeah, the hardest lesson is being too trusting. What sort of information do you want to give about uh, Magnolia? I mean, we're talking about a completely different market to what you're usually marketing to. So what would be the most appropriate ways to point listeners to find out more about you? More about, yeah, we're getting a new website. Um, historically, we haven't had really had the need because we've only had a handful of investors. So follow the website, follow me on Twitter, have a look of what we're doing. Obviously, investment advice we can't provide, but if we're doing transactions, just follow. Happy to work with some of the companies. Reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. We're pretty transparent. And also, we spend a lot of time talking to CEOs and companies with basic questions. So I'm happy to reach out if any companies you know we're a part of. Ask me the questions. I'm even happy to yeah, organize calls or answer your questions in the, the no BS jargon terminology. So anything you need to clear up, just reach out. So Twitter's the best spot to find you? Twitter's the best spot. Yeah. So what's your tag there, handle? It's magnolia underscore Mitch. Okay, magnolia underscore Mitch. Yep. Very creative. <laughs> <laughs> okay, magnolia underscore Mitch, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you. Hey, thanks, mate. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast.